Hey everyone, my name is Trent Lipinski. I'm the host of Crypto Disrupted. Uh, it's a podcast uh, that focuses on cryptocurrency and blockchain. Uh, I have interviewed close to 40 different entrepreneurs, uh, CEOs, uh, CTOs, uh, employees at various uh, blockchain and crypto based companies. Um, so I've gotten you know, a lot of insight into what's happening in crypto and the crypto space. Uh, you know, I've talked to a lot of different, uh, like I said, a lot of different CEOs. I've interviewed some lawyers in this space. Uh, I've interviewed, uh, you know, different co-founders. I've interviewed, uh, who else have I talked to? I've talked to several different investors as well. Um, so, you know, I've gotten a lot of, a lot of different insight into what's happening in crypto. Uh, you know, what's happening to the ICO space. Uh, for example, I'm seeing a lot of people uh, switching over from ICOs uh, to uh, actually STOs. So I think uh, we're going to see a lot more STOs and a lot more people. Um, and we're going to see a lot more people uh, moving over to, uh, you know, STOs. Uh, moving forward, I'm gonna. Looks like I need to disable my uh, my little notification sounds here. Hold on one second. Um, I'm gonna do that real quick. One second here while I turn those off. I'm a little new to Discord, so uh, I'm I'm about uh, 32. So I uh, I have plenty of experience with like ICQ. I, I, IRC and, uh, you know, some of the older Slack and some of the other chat tools, but uh, I have not gotten to know uh, uh, Discord as much. So uh, please bear with me here while I uh, mute these notifications. Uh, there we go. I hate to age myself, but <laughs> um, anyways. Uh, so, yeah. So I, like I said, uh, just for the people who have joined recently, just to kind of recap, so I host Crypto Disrupted. Uh, there's actually a little bit of an announcement. Um, I'm actually looking at potentially taking over uh, for HackerNoon.com uh, to be their new pod get, uh, pod, podcast host. So I'm going to be taking that over soon. Um, so we're, we're still trying to figure out what to do with Crypto Disrupted. We're definitely going to keep it online. Um, and I've got a bunch more episodes that are going to be coming out soon. Um, so, so yeah, so we're going to be, hopefully I'm going to be doing some bigger and better interviews soon. Uh, we're going to take, you know, less of my gorilla approach with uh, Crypto Disrupted and we're going to try and do some higher quality episodes, actually have a sound guy help edit them uh, and, you know, try to focus on some bigger and better interviews. So uh, looking at hopefully getting that up sometime in September, uh, I've still got uh, another like, seven to 10 episodes that I need to release on Crypto Disrupted. So Crypto Disrupted is not going anywhere in the short term. Uh, I've still got some amazing interviews, uh, lawyers coming up, C different CEOs. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of different stuff coming up uh, on Crypto Disrupted still. So I'm going to be uploading that on YouTube. It'll be on the iTunes and everything. Uh, everything will be released as normal. So I'm going to get all those episodes out soon. Uh, it's just a matter of uh, getting those out. So uh, at the moment, though, I'm not recording any new episodes until I can get this next set out. And then I'll most likely be taking some of my interviews and moving them over to Hacker Noon so, uh, in the future. So uh, yeah, a lot of big things going on. Um, it's, been, it's been a really interesting experience, uh, you know, doing this Crypto Disrupted uh, podcast. I didn't you know, I started in January. I didn't really know where it was going to lead. Uh, I originally had a co-host, uh, and then that kind of fizzled out. So I kind of had to take it over, you know, partway through and kind of move things forward from there. Um, and then now, uh, you know, it's led to me uh, taking over the Hacker Noon podcast. So um, and helping them get that off the ground. Um, so yeah, no, no worries. Uh, Greg's still alive. He's not dead, but, uh, uh, yeah, him and I did split up, uh, and I have been doing, you know, the more recent episodes recently on my own. Um, not going to get into the reasons for that, but, uh, 
he went and focused on some of his other ICO stuff. So, um, you know, as I was saying earlier, one of the things I've noticed is the ICO space has changed a lot. Um, you know, so if you guys have questions about, you know, what I've seen from some of the, uh, from some of the episodes and interviews I've done, uh, you know, I've interviewed, you know, uh, guys who have had multi-billion dollar exits, uh, Alex Minuski over at, uh, hope I'm pronouncing his name right, over at Celsius Network. Um, he's had some very, uh, you know, he's had, he's had a pretty interesting career and some pretty successful exits. Um, you know, I interviewed, uh, what was it, Matthew Sullivan. He, uh, he actually used to work with Richard Branson, also has a very extensive career. Uh, one of the more recent episodes, uh, Wall Street guy, um, he, uh, you know, he's got tons of experience. So, you know, there's a lot of great, great guests that I've had on the show. And then the episodes that I still have yet to release, I've got some amazing episodes recorded as well. Um, so again, just trying to get those out. Um, and before I start, uh, you know, working on the Hacker Noon podcast. So um, still going to continue to cover crypto and blockchain. Uh, I'm just hopefully going to have a slightly bigger audience uh, with Hacker Noon. So Hacker Noon's actually been supporting Crypto Disrupted and they've published, uh, you know, most of our podcast episodes and, uh, you know, they've given us quite a bit of traffic and they've been really supportive. So, uh, so it's kind of natural for us to kind of transition into uh, working with them because they've been working with us since the beginning anyways, really. Um, so yeah, now, uh, now next, you know, it's, uh, it's really about trying to get, like I said, bigger guests. Uh, I'd love to talk to the founders of Ethereum if possible. Uh, we're currently working on that. Um, you know, trying to, uh, I'd love to talk to like, you know, some of the investment firms that invested in, uh, you know, that invested in Coinbase. I'd love to talk to some of the, you know, some of the, see what's happening kind of actually on like the VC front when it comes to crypto, um, because there's a lot, there's a lot of interest from venture capital, especially I'm here in San Francisco. So I'm in Silicon Valley. Um, so it's been interesting to see how we've kind of transitioned from like the ICO to, you know, more traditional raises. Um, it's also been interesting to see like, you know, how a lot of how a lot of different startups, they're actually looking at doing their seed rounds or their initial angel rounds uh, or even a series A in cash. And then, uh, you know, they're going to then take the cash to invest in doing an ICO or utility token, you know, in the future. Um, so, yeah, I, I know a couple of people at Consensus as well. So that's who we're, we're talking to at the moment. But, uh, you know, still, uh, I don't want to promise anyone yet or anything because everything's still kind of in the works right now. But, uh, you know, we're, we're hopeful that, you know, with the Hacker New name that we'll be able to get some bigger guests. Uh, you know, when I started Crypto Disrupted, uh, I just knew crypto was going to take off. Uh, I knew that, you know, blockchain was going to be, you know, a big, uh, you know, a big opportunity. I mean, I've been around in the tech scene for a long time. Uh, back in the day, I used to run an Apple News and Rumor website about 15 years ago. So I actually used to attend Steve Jobs keynotes and go to like Macworld events and stuff. I mean, this was pre-iPhone, pre-iPod even. Um, and uh, <clears throat> I used to cover all that kind of stuff as a tech journalist. So, um, so those were kind of like my early days in journalism. So I've seen, you know, multiple different waves of technology and different technology systems and different movements that have kind of happened in tech. Um, so, you know, I was like mostly in my early teens for like the dot com bus, uh, but like a lot of my parent, my parents and friends' parents, you know, got affected by the dot com bus. So I kind of got to see that, like, kind of, you know, I kind of refer to these different movements that happen in tech as waves. Um, so, you know, you've got, you had kind of this dot-com wave, uh, you had all those dot-com startups in the early, you know, late nineties, early two thousands, that wave then violently crashed against the shore, uh, in like the early two thousands after that busted, uh, you know, we had obviously in 2000, end of 2007, 2008, you had mobile phones take off, smartphones, the introduction of the iPhone, you had Android get acquired by Google, uh, and that pretty much just, you know, 
I mean, that's still a wave we're all riding to this day. Um, you know, and then you have the iPad and everything. So now blockchain, crypto, you know, it's really about, you know, I kind of hate the term web 3.0, but that's really what we're seeing. Uh, you know, it's about reinventing the internet. It's about creating decentralized solutions. Um, and it's about, you know, ultimately getting all that stuff that I was promised when I was a kid, <laughs> uh, you know, about what the internet was going to be able to do and, uh, you know, have all this decentralized stuff. Um, because ultimately we ended up with a centralized internet that's done a lot of harm to a lot of people. Uh, and I think the way we've got social media set up and the censorship and the privacy issues and frankly, all the bullshit we've seen lately, uh, you know, even Alex Jones and Infowars has been center censored. Like, you know, I've never, I've never been a huge fan of Infowars, but like there have been times when like. Infowars did cover things that the mainstream media didn't, um, especially some of the other uh, journalists that work for in Infowars. Um, Alex Jones, obviously, you know, he has his own opinions, but, uh, you know, some of the other people who work for Infowars are legitimate journalists. Um, not to say that Alex Jones isn't a legitimate journalist. He just obviously has his own flavor of things. Um, so, you know, it's it's been fascinating to kind of watch uh, you know, post 2016, uh, you know, since we've kind of stepped into this Trump era, you know, watching what happened in 2017 with crypto taking off uh, and having a total bull market. And then now here we are in 2018 and like this horrible bear market uh, and seeing, you know, what's happened to crypto since then. Um, you know, I still think crypto is like, I mean, it's, it's going to go back up eventually. I don't know when. It could be a couple of years. It could be a couple of months. It could be tomorrow. Um, you know, I obviously can't predict the future, but uh, you know what I can tell you is, you know, I've noticed patterns. Just being an executive in the tech industry, having run a tech startup, uh, there are patterns to the U.S. dollar and currency, um, and the long and the more company and like. You know, as a consultant over the last three years, I've, you know, had some transparency to financials for a lot of different companies. And I've noticed the same pattern in terms of revenue, no matter what the company is, no matter what like market it's in, there are just simply trends within the spending patterns of people who are spending US dollars. Uh, and you can see those patterns start to emerge the more financials you get access to. Uh, and I saw those numbers at my own startup. I've seen these numbers repeated, uh, you know, at other people's startups. So, you know, there's definitely a trend of the strength of the U.S. dollar. And then there is a correlation of that, I believe, to crypto. Um, so, you know, we saw a lot of instability uh, potentially last year with the U.S. dollar and, you know, potential trade wars with China and all this crazy stuff going on. So now... The U.S. dollar has actually strengthened in 2018 on, uh, with some of the decisions Trump made. Um, I think it's probably short-term fixes that he's made. I don't know if this is a long-term solution or not. But, you know, if you look at the stock market, the stock market is doing incredibly well. Um, and I don't know if that's a good thing or not. At the same time, we've seen like a 24% decrease in Facebook's value in like a single day of afternoon trading. Um, so like, you know, after hours trading, so Facebook, I mean, I've never seen a tech company lose 24% of its value overnight. Um, that was, that was insane. So, I mean, to me, that's an indicator that, you know, something is coming. That was a pretty major correction. Um, and, you know, we've seen a lot of consolidation, you know, back in like the early two thousands, um, there was a, there was a website actually called, uh, it's called Fucked Company, um, and it documented all the failing startups and all the uh, all the stuff that was happening during the dot com bust. And like, I, they never ended up monetizing it or anything like that, but it ended up being kind of this source of information of what was happening. And unfortunately, in twenty eighteen and twenty seventeen, there that doesn't exist today. There's nobody documenting this. There's nobody tracking it. Um, you know, TechCrunch and, you know, these tech news sites are now all owned by uh, Verizon and, you know, AOL and major corporations now. So 
they only publish good news. They don't really publish the bad news. Um, and you know, the blogosphere and RSS feeds and all that kind of stuff has kind of died. And, you know, we've entered a new era of information and social media. So, um, yeah, deadcoins.com. Uh, so, you know, deadcoins.com is obviously tracking what's happening in the crypto space, but you know, there's, there's greater stuff happening just in tech general, uh, companies that are running out of money that can't raise funding right now, uh, that, you know, are, they're getting acquired. Um, a lot of companies are being acquired by bigger and bigger companies, and it's not necessarily good news. Uh, sometimes when a company gets acquired, it's because they had too much debt. Uh, it's because they ran out of investment funding. Uh, you know, they, uh, and a lot of these companies are being short sold. So they're being sold for a lower value than what they're actually worth. So what's happening is the venture capital firms uh, and a lot of the major tech companies they're just buying up as much intellectual property as they can. So these billion dollar companies are just buying, you know, as much intellectual property. So, you know, are we going to see that with crypto? I don't know. Maybe um, it's totally a possibility. Uh, we could start to see, you know, especially with crypto projects that like open source their code. Uh, you know, we could start to see some of the dead projects. Some of their code might start getting lifted. Uh, if they open source it and it might start ending up in uh, other projects and new projects and people are going to fork those projects. Um, so if the code doesn't end up getting released open source and there's no value there, then I don't know, maybe it deserves to be on the dead coin list. Um, so ultimately, you know, what it comes down to and what any startup comes down to is it's about creating value for people. Uh, and that's ultimately what, you know, we're seeing with crypto is, we're seeing a new system for being able to create value for people. Um, and that's what the blockchain is. That's what cryptocurrency is, is these are new systems and new metrics and new ways of doing business, new ways of creating, uh, you know, different value systems. I look at like what the guys have done from Holochain, like that's probably one of my favorite projects. Um, they've, I mean, they're looking at like, how do we create like a post currency society um so they're really looking at it from an, the aspect of uh barter um you know how do we create a cryptocurrency decentralized network that is really a system of barter um so i give up some bandwidth here and you know in exchange you give me some storage there uh type of situation that's kind of the some of the core concepts of what they're exploring from a coding basis um, I had an amazing interview recently. If you have not checked this one out, uh, you should check. This is probably one of my favorite episodes lately is uh, with Ija. Um, he's the lead developer from Rockstar Games. He developed Grand Theft Auto V. Um, perhaps you've heard of it. Um, he uh, So he's working on a new project called Prometheur, uh, and it's pretty awesome. Uh, so I actually got to meet up with him uh, in person when I was in Las Vegas a couple of weeks ago uh, for DEF CON. And, uh, you know, he's basically creating a decentralized network um, that uh, he's creating a decentralized network that has privacy built in. So literally creating user profiles where, you know, anonymity is built into it, where you can just flip a switch and go into anonymous mode. Um, so Prometheur is a pretty cool project and I can't wait to see what gets built on the decentralized network that he's building. Um, because this is a guy again, who built Grand Theft Auto five. Um, so he's overcome some major technical challenges. Like a lot of people forget GTA five was released on the PS three originally. Um, so most people have probably played it on a next gen console, but you know, it was a previous generation console game. So he had to fit that entire game on 512 megabytes of memory, um, which is just an insane technical feat, uh, not to mention building the network that allowed uh, you know, everyone to be able to play in the online mode. Uh, looks like we've got a question here. Uh, so the difference between Holochain, Bitcoin, and some of the Filecoin and some of these existing blockchain solutions is I would say Holochain is kind of a post-blockchain solution. Um, so they're actually, cr they've created their own architecture essentially for how to, uh, ha how, to how to handle data and how to handle transactions. Um, so 
it's not the same system structure that uh, Bitcoin and like traditional cryptocurrencies use. Um, really, what Holochain today really is, uh, all it really is at the moment is a peer-to-peer -peer network. Um, and they're building a rule system on top of that peer-to-peer -peer network that, you know, the thing that I could compare it to that people probably understand the easiest is uh, smart contracts. But really what it is, is it's, it's a rule system. Um, so what that rule system is, is so like, let's say, for example, I wanted to create a decentralized version of Discord, for example, I wanted to, you know, create a chat app. So I could then launch that on the Holochain peer-to-peer -peer network, and then I could use their rule system and their code system to determine, you know, what are the set of rules to be able to interact with my application? Uh, what do you have to do, uh, you know, to be able to participate? Maybe there's, you know, a coin you have to consume or some kind of you know system where you can earn coins for participating and using the decentralized application um so really you know what they're building right now is kind of that network and that platform uh for decentralized applications so i think they've already built some chat applications on hollow chain uh you know i was at a hackathon about a gosh almost year year and a half ago now uh with them that uh you know, they had built a Twitter clone. Um, so you can build real decentralized applications on Holochain uh, in terms of like being able to get up and running. I mean, I saw guys building entire, you know, at least initial foundations for decentralized applications in a couple days. Um, so, you know, they've basically created a framework that allows you to launch D apps like rapidly. Um, so they're still trying to build up a developer base. You know, they've done an ICO. Uh, they've got their hardware component where those hardware devices are actually going to provide the initial compute for their network. Um, so that's that's pretty cool. Um, so they've uh, you know they've done a lot and they've come pretty far. Um, I I actually need to catch up with them again. Um, and you know they actually I'd love to actually have them on the new podcast I'm going to be doing for Hacker Noon um, because. You know they've got a they've got a really interesting project, and I like the approach they're taking. Um, Prometheus is kind of taking a similar approach, but down a different path. They're mostly focused on privacy. Uh, they're mostly focused on uh, you know making sure that uh, they can create essentially you know a privacy focused decentralized network. At the same time, uh, you're going to be able to build a set of decentralized apps on top of Prometheus as well. So you know the competition is heating up. Uh, in terms of, you know, companies that are working on decentralized networking solutions. Uh, I interviewed uh, Greg Asuri from Akash Network um, recently. I have, not I have not aired that episode yet. That one is going to be coming out soon. Uh, that was another great episode, but uh, hopefully I'll get that out in the, within a couple weeks. But um, he's working on a really cool, uh, a really cool application where basically you install his his code, it's almost like a miniature operating system on your server on, you know, you can do a cloud server, bare metal server, uh, if you're running, you know, your own server at home, whatever, uh, you know, you can download this little mini operating system he's created, and then basically get paid for any excess resources on your computer system, or on your server or on your node. Um, and, you know, get paid in crypto for your bandwidth, your storage, your CPU, um, whatever. Uh, and he's creating a tool to be able to do that, uh, you know, that anyone's going to be able to download and operate. So I don't know all the exact specifics of his cryptocurrency or his utility token yet. Um, no, this is, uh, this is a cash network, uh, Greg Asuri's new project. Um, so this is going to be, th this is, this, in my opinion, this is going to be a game changer. Um, so, you know, essentially the biggest problem that we have with decentralization and cryptocurrency, and this is one of the major challenges that I've seen is, you know, we talk about the benefits of decentralization. Decentralization is great. Um, but how the hell are we actually going to get there? Um, you know, the reality is 80% of all cloud computing is happening on Amazon. The other 20% is happening on Microsoft Azure. Uh, it's happening on Google Cloud. Uh, you know, there's a couple other cloud providers, you know, 
GoDaddy's kind of thrown their hat into the ring a little bit. You've got uh, OVH in Europe. Um, you've got a couple different, yeah, IBM. Uh, you've got a different cloud providers in China, um, in Japan, South Korea, and the Asian markets as well. So the majority of compute right now, uh, you know, is happening in Facebook servers. It's happening in Apple servers, and the public doesn't even have access to it. Um, so Amazon obviously sells it as a service, um, but you know, Apple does not. Apple probably has you know some of the most advanced data centers in the world. Same with Facebook. Uh, and they keep those data centers for themselves. So, you know, I kind of see this as a, a war of, uh, you know, who has the biggest computer. And, you know, that's why I think Ethereum was so successful and will be successful in the future, because essentially Ethereum is a decentralized computer. Um, does it have scalability issues? Are there some initial tech challenges right now? Yes, absolutely. Um, it's going to take a lot of iteration, time, uh, and you know they're going to have to they're going to have to work on a variety of different things like the Casper protocols and figuring out proof of stake models, side chains, uh, you know all those different things. So you know there's a lot uh, there's a lot of challenges ahead for you know Ethereum and you know decentralized computing. But I think tools like the Cash Network uh, are going to help get there because it allows us to decentralize the existing infrastructure. Um, and it allows us to do so in a way where it takes DevOps, developer operations into consideration. And that's where we're at right now. Like the projects that I would be like the most interested in following and the projects I've been following closely are the people who are working on infrastructure, uh, the people who are working on developer operations, the people who are building the infrastructure that's going to power uh, future decentralized applications. because. For like the average consumer, like they they need something with a user interface that is equivalent to Discord, that's equivalent to uh, Facebook, that's equivalent to Twitter, that's equivalent to you know the tools that we're used to using. So someone somewhere is going to have to create user interface and user interface designs and decentralized applications that equal that are either equal or better than. Uh, you know, the existing user interfaces that we're used to on our mobile devices. So it's going to take a while to get there because, I mean, companies have literally spent billions of dollars to get to their UI UX. I look at Twitter, for example, and like Twitter changes their user interface like every couple months. Um, like they are constantly changing how their search page looks, how trending looks. Uh, they're constantly changing you know, how their application functions, what, how you get to different areas of the application. Um, you know, sometimes they're adding new things. They're constantly A-B testing. Um, you know, so billions of dollars have been spent on those interfaces. So it's going to take time uh, and it's going to take a lot of infrastructure, especially on the decentralized side of things to actually get there. Um, so once those networks are in place, once you know, we've seen with Ethereum, you know, that decentralized computing, you know, I mean, Ethereum is what, 70, 80% of the ICOs, maybe 90% of the ICOs out there. A lot of the developers are focusing on Ethereum now. Um, so, you know, we've seen that. So now we're going to start to see things like the Prometheus network take off, the Akash network take off, the Holochain network take off. Uh, we're going to start to see some of these other decentralized networks and some of these other decentralized solutions. Uh, come into play. And then on the investment side, uh, we're going to see a lot of regulation. I mean, security tokens are the next wave. Uh, 2019 is going to be the year of the security token. Um, and we're going to see a lot of, you know, a lot of people pivot away from ICOs, at least in the United States, and pivot towards STOs um, and security token, uh, you know, uh, type events. I'm seeing a lot of startups taking the, uh, taking the private sale route um, and they're doing even traditional seed rounds in you know US dollars from investors uh, and then their game plan is to you know raise five million in cash you know get a minimum viable product to the market uh, and then and then release their ICO and their utility tokens uh, and go raise you know 25 mil or whatever. Um, so I'm seeing that model playing out across a lot of the startups I've been talking to, both on the consulting side and 
uh, people that I've interviewed on Crypto Disrupted. So, you know, there's definitely kind of a sea change, especially with the bear market that we're in now. Um, and, you know, people are opting in for regulation. Um, one of my favorite models that I've actually seen uh, is from one of the people I've had on my podcast, a company called Lannister Development. Um, so they they reverse mergered with a publicly traded company on the OTC market to become a fully regulated publicly traded company. So you can go buy their stock on the OTC market, you know, on the existing stock market, you can you know, buy their stock with an E-Trade account uh, today. So they basically opted in to being a fully regulated blockchain development company. Um, and they've got, you know, they've got both their agency that they're building out uh, and that's where they're going to be generating most of their revenue, but they're also working on a capital side uh, and a holdings company as well. But uh, so, you know, you can, you can go read their press releases. You know, they're, they're constantly releasing press releases on the OTC market. They are doing everything legally and by the books. Um, so, you know, I think that's a really interesting model. Uh, and I haven't seen anyone else take that path yet because basically they're saying like, we're opting in to be regulated to make, you know, working with crypto and blockchain less scary for traditional investors, traditional companies. Um, you know, they're working on a lot of enterprise contracts and enterprise projects. Um, so, you know, they're, they're helping these major companies adopt the blockchain, build blockchain solutions, uh, and wanted to select a legal framework to be able to do that, to build confidence and trust, uh, rather than kind of operate, uh, you know, in the gray zone where a lot of ICOs have been operating from. So not to say that operating in the gray zone is a bad thing. I think it's a good thing in some ways, uh, because it allows for innovation, allows us to work around the system. Uh, but at the same time, you know, regulation exists for a reason. Uh, you know, a lot of people have lost a lot of money, uh, you know, in the crypto space, a lot of, you know, ICOs have failed. I mean, one of the fascinating statistics I've seen was that uh, a 50% of ICOs fail four months post successful raise. Um, so these are ICOs that have successfully raised money. So, you know, whether it's a million dollars or fifty million dollars, uh, and they're failing within four months. Um, yeah, a fail or an exit scam—it's hard to say. Um, you know, from some of them, some of them are exit scams um, for sure. Um, others, I would argue, are—you uh, know—it's—it's it's just simply the reality of running a startup. Um, a lot of them are founder issues. So, you know, when you're sitting in a room together and you're poor and you have no money uh, and you're creating your startup and you're doing your ICO, like that's one thing. But then when you've suddenly got $10 million sitting in the bank account, um, there's all of a sudden, you know, how do you spend that $10 million? Uh, you know, who's going to decide where that money gets spent? Uh, you know, maybe the CEO wants to double down on marketing and, you know, the CTO and the dev team you know, wants to go double down on building product. Um, so, you know, you get conflict between founders uh, and money escalates those conflicts dramatically. Um, I personally have experienced this uh, in my own startups. I've experienced this with companies I've worked for. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot, you know, founder issues are a major reason why some startups fail. Um, so I imagine that's a big issue as well. Um, and then yes, some of those ICOs were scams. Um, you know, I've seen, I've seen some weird behavior, you know, from some of these companies where, you know, they raise a bunch of money and then they immediately go on a road show. And I'm like thinking like, wait a second, like why, like you just raised all this money to go build product, you know, X, Y, or Z. And now the first thing you do is start traveling around the world and you're not putting your dev team together. You're not doing a product crunch, like to actually build a product, like, you know, and I talk about this, uh, in the episode with Ija, uh, who used to work for rockstar games. And, you know, he used to have to go through this when launching games with rockstar, you know, you have to go, you have to basically lock yourself in a room for six months and do a, you know, a product launch. Um, you know, it's often called a crunch or a sprint, uh, in the dev world. 
and you know you're you're working anywhere between 60 to 100 hours a week to get your product out the door so that is the mode that these startups need to go into uh when they're post ico um they need to go into crunch mode they need to go into sprint mode and they need to start building so if they're going on road shows uh and they're not focused on building their product uh that's a bad sign to me um so what i'm trying to do is i'm trying to actually find icos and projects that are you know have had successful raises and kind of help guide them through that initial like six month like turmoil process um that happens post ico um because that's where like i said 50 percent of these startups are failing um so if you can get through that like first three to six months and you know get reorganized you know get your marketing back under control um and that's another huge mistake i see is like companies will go raise all this money they'll spend all this energy doing their raise and then the second they've ra successfully raised their money they turn their marketing off um and that is like the biggest mistake in ico and anyone post ico can make is like why would you turn your marketing off why would you stop sending press releases like why would you stop you know building on that momentum um so that's huge like any company that's doing an ico should be doubling down on their marketing post ico they should be talking about the partnerships they're making they should be talking about their roadmap they should be telling the public like here's what we're doing here's our strategy here's our game plan here's the people we just partnered with um, you know, and I am not seeing that from a lot of ICOs. I'm seeing them go like completely silent, um, after they've raised a bunch of money. So I understand like the ICOs and the, and the different blockchain companies that like, you know, consistently, like they let their GitHub speak for itself. I'm fine with that. Um, like if they're committing code and like, they've got a release cycle and a published roadmap and like they're meeting deadlines and they're not doing a bunch of press releases around it because they're waiting till, you know, uh, their main, uh, they've launched their main net or their test net or whatever, and they want to, you know, highlight major events, that's fine. As long as you can go see that, like, hey, there's code being committed. Uh, this project's real. Um, if you can see that, then that's great. Um, but again, ICOs that go silent, that don't have any commits on GitHub, uh, that is a bad sign. So, you know, hopefully, you know, some of these ICOs and some of the regulations and doing STOs and following some of these, you know, these pr best practices um, from, you know, the slightly more traditional space will actually help the ICO space. Um, I think it'll, you know, some of those practices that exist for a reason. Um, I don't agree. I obviously don't fully agree with like, um, you know, central banking i'm not a fan of you know any of the financials like i mean the system that we have today is just rigged um so you know the us dollar the trade war that's happening with china like all this crap that's happening between nations and countries like i think it's bs um like i've watched inflation get worse as i've gotten older uh and i've watched the wealth inequality get worse I mean, go walk around the streets of San Francisco and you will find homeless people in their teens and 20s. Um, you know, we always had that one homeless guy in the corner uh, in the 90s and that, you know, everyone kind of knew. Um, but now, like, legitimately, people are losing their homes and their livelihoods and are ending up homeless on the streets. And it's young people. Um, meanwhile, you know, I'm seeing, you know, tech startups, you know, raise millions of dollars and seeing entrepreneurs come into the city and, you know, you know, making a ton of money and being super successful and driving Teslas and all that or Lambos, I guess, for this audience. But, um, you know, and I'm seeing that as well. So, uh, you know, so it, it, it's just kind of crazy to see, you know, the billionaires and the wealthy get wealthier uh, and the poor just get poorer. So, you know, I don't agree with the current financial system, but like I said, some of the best practices that came out of regulation, like, you know, having quarterly reports, uh, sending press releases, telling the public what's going on, I think those are good things. Uh, and I think 
you know, we don't want to go too far in the wrong direction where, you know, that information and those regulations and those kinds of things like uh, just are completely ignored and it just increases the risk for investors and everyone else. Um, so anyways, I've kind of been ranting here for a while. Thank you everyone for listening. If you've got questions, you know, please feel free to ask me. Uh, like I said, I've been exposed to a lot of different CEOs. Uh, you know, I've spoken at blockchain economic forum. Uh, you know, I've talked to a lot of different investors, uh, and I've been, you know, pretty, I, I'm pretty much married to this space. And, you know, now that I'm going to be taking over the Hacker Noon podcast, uh, you know, there's going to be, uh, you know, I'm, I'm hoping to get some bigger and better guests. And then I've got a bunch of episodes coming out still, like the one I mentioned with Greg Asuri. Um, no, I've not spoken with Enigma. Uh, not familiar with them. There's so many, so many projects out there. Um, so I, I, I'll definitely check them out, though. Um, yeah, they're, like I said, I, I mean, that is the other crazy thing about crypto is like every day I hear of a new project that I have not heard of yet before. Um, it reminds me a lot of kind of like this happened a little bit like during the, the dot com era. It happened kind of again in like 2006 and 2007. Um, you know, obviously then we kind of had the crash in 2008. But, uh, you know, and then we had another kind of startup boom, obviously, in Silicon Valley between 2013 and 2015. Um, so, all right, back to questions. Um, something I'm excited for by the end of the year. Um, end of the year. Oof. I'm hoping crypto goes back up. I mean, uh, you know, I, I, think, I think right now the market's kind of, uh, you know, it's in a weird place. Um, I think what happened, I think the reason why we went into the bear market is the traditional invent traditional investors, uh, and accredited investors basically use Bitcoin and crypto last year as a vehicle, uh, to move assets around, um, in a way that was unregulated. So they, you know, people were moving money out of China or moving money to China or, uh, moving money from the U S into other countries. Um, you know, a lot happened with the paradise papers. A lot of, uh, a lot of investors had their portfolios revealed publicly, uh, portfolios that had been private, some of which for hundreds of years. Um, so a lot of things happened, um, you know, in terms of, you know, Trump getting elected, uh, the paradise papers, which was a major, major leak that kind of went under the radar. Um, you know, we had we had a lot of things take place. So, you know, Bitcoin, crypto, blockchain enabled traditional investors from around the world to mobilize their money and transfer wealth in a way that we've never seen before. Um, then they cashed out um, and there was almost a coordinated effort to cash out. Um, and that's what put us into this bear market. Um, you know, it's. Uh, it's unfortunate for the small investors uh, who didn't cash out in time. Uh, and, you know, it, it is kind of what it is. So a lot of the cash that did get cashed out has been placed into traditional investments. It's been placed into other investments uh, and it's been the money's been moved around. So and then, of course, as I said earlier, you know, the U.S. dollar is actually strengthened in 2018. So. Um, you know, it makes sense for them to move that money back into the U.S. dollar. So what I kind of anticipate is that when there is a sign of the U.S. dollar weakening, um, that, you know, crypto will go back up again. Um, how much? I don't know. Will it be the end of the year? I, hopefully, um, you know, for the, for the average crypto investor, I hope that's the case. Um, at the same time, you know, it's, there's definitely, I you know, there's definitely a downside to a weakened dollar. Um, but at the same time, it will accelerate the transition to crypto. Um, so, you know, I'm hoping that that transition happens, you know, kind of carefully over time rather than, you know, a major collapse of the U.S. dollar. Um, but it might take a major collapse of the U.S. dollar for, you know, crypto to really be legitimized. So, We'll see what happens. I don't know if that's going to happen by the end of the year. I don't know if it's going to take a few more years or not, but we'll see. 
Uh, in terms of news, blogs, websites that I follow, obviously I read Hacker Noon uh, and I've been a contributor there for a number of years. Um, I also obviously read Reddit. Um, you know, I'm on a lot of different subreddits. Uh, obviously our cryptocurrency, uh, you know, pretty much read it daily. Uh, I also read Hacker News, uh, the Y Combinator Hacker News. Um, I read that pretty much daily as well. It's another news aggregator, uh, kind of a little more old school. It's not the best website uh, in terms of tech, but the quality of content and contributions there, uh, you know, is you know, there's it's it's a it's a fairly it's a fairly decent and established uh, audience. I pay less attention to Venture Beat and TechCrunch. Um, like I than I used to. Um, those kind of used to be like what I used to read mostly, but nowadays, you know, I check them once or twice a week. Um, the reason why I don't like TechCrunch, uh, VentureBeat, and some of these other like mainstream kind of like tech sites like The Verge and those kind of sites um, is they're basically, you know, they're basically propaganda outlets. I don't know how else to put it. Um, you know, it's PR, it's press. They're they're not really. They're not really covering real tech news anymore. Um, they're just covering, you know, what the venture capital firms want them to cover, uh, and they're covering what the major billion-dollar centralized, you know, monopolies want them to cover. Um, you know, I basically read them occasionally to track, like, you know, oh, who got acquired, you know, who got a major investment round, those th types of things, um, and then mostly I use that to track the venture capital firms. Because uh, I want to see which venture capital firms are spending where and why. Um, I want to see how much, what they're investing in. Uh, and that's kind of a good way of figuring out. But you've got to do research because they don't always publish who those VC firms are. Um, so, um, yeah, there's no, there's definitely, so, yeah, for the VC stuff, like, you know, when it, what I've learned over the years is, like, if you want to know the, the, you know, the true owners of, uh, of Silicon Valley, it's the VC firms. It's not the CEOs. The CEOs work for the venture capital firms. Um, so it's actually the venture capital firms that are mostly calling the shots. Um, and it's the major tech companies, Google, Facebook, um, you name it, that are calling the shots. So um, so there's, so the, yeah, so I, I would say, especially for crypto, like, you know, following TechCrunch, following, you know, VentureBeat or The Verge or some of those larger uh, tech news sites, they're probably not the greatest. Um, they're only good for tracking mainstream news, really. Um, if you want to find, like, new crypto projects, uh, you know, and you want to find the cutting edge, uh, you know, that's where Hacker Noon, that's where Reddit, that's where Hacker News, um, that's where those sites kind of come into play. Um, so. You know, there's there's a lot of different aggregators out there for different tech news, and that that's probably your best bet. Um, and you know, customizing those aggregators like Reddit uh, and following the different subreddits of the projects you're interested in, um, and you know, Telegram to some extent is useful. I I don't know. I find it kind of cluttered sometimes. Um, the really active channels have too much conversation and not enough news. And the inactive channels have too much news and not enough conversation. So, um, you know, chat as a platform for following the news, it's hit or miss. Um, so mainly, you know, mainly, like I said, I, I follow the major aggregators and then I'll follow projects individually. Twitter, I will follow projects on Twitter as well. Um, and that's another good source of, you know, if you find a project you want to follow, follow it on Twitter. I also I use Coin Market Cap. I use uh, you know some of the you know some of the crypto and you know sites that list uh, you know different crypto projects and coins um, to see you know when they're adding new coins, new projects, um, you know what they are, you know what their valuations are, what the projects are. Um, obviously, there's a lot more projects lately um, than there used to be, so it it's not the best way of tracking it. But uh, you know it does. Sites that do get listed on like Coin Market Cap, for example, like you know they have passed some level of due diligence to be able to get there. Um, so yeah, and I I don't have a hard cutoff. I do. I should probably get going in about thirty minutes, but I can definitely keep going. Um,
Yeah, demonization a lot of you. Yeah, a lot of stuff happened in India for sure. Um, India, China, uh, the Asian markets. Um, I mean, from what I understand, and some of the people that I've talked to that uh, have traveled in Asia, Japan apparently is like they're they're on the blockchain. Um, Japan and South Korea, um, and also uh, actually Vietnam. Uh, was one of the countries that I was told that, uh, uh, as well as Singapore as well. Um, but Vietnam, I found interesting. So apparently what's happening is a lot of Chinese uh, kind of, so I don't know how a lot of people know how the Chinese uh, culture kind of works, but basically the Chinese kind of have this elite class um, that, you know, own the businesses and the properties, and then they kind of have subclass divisions underneath them. Um, so it's, you know, they're still... They, they've embraced capitalism uh, to a significant degree compared to the past, but at the end of the day, they still have kind of a class system. Um, so this elite class in China has been using Vietnam as kind of a legal uh, haven uh, for crypto projects. So uh, they'll go to Vietnam, you know, they can travel there pretty easily, uh, you know, invest in companies there uh, and kind of use that as a holding company uh, space. So it's kind of like, for example, how American companies used Ireland to hold European wealth and, you know, holding companies. Uh, Vietnam has kind of become the Ireland of uh, China for crypto and blockchain projects. So I found that to be really interesting. Uh, one of my developer friends, he did a tour of Asia just to kind of go explore and, you know, see what the reality was of what's happening in Asia. Um, and, you know, he kind of reported uh, that information back to me. So I, I feel like he's a pretty credible source and he literally went and visited these countries in person, met with a lot of these companies, met with a lot of the, uh, the founders of major blockchain companies in these countries. So, um, so yeah, so that, I thought that was really interesting. So Asia, I mean, in terms of blockchain, they've, in China in particular, like they're on it. Um, you know, they've got developers, they have resources. Uh, you know, they're working on major infrastructure plays. Uh, you know, it's it's a huge, huge opportunity for uh, for that part of the world. And I would argue, you know, they will probably embrace more blockchain technology faster than the United States will uh, because of how their system is set up. Uh, you know, they're they're able to move some certain things fairly quickly. At the same time, they can also block things fairly quickly. Um, so, you know, I know, uh, but I definitely, I definitely see China as being, you know, a major implementer of blockchain technologies for a lot of their infrastructure. And the main reason for that is actually supply chain management. Um, and that's going to be a huge, huge use case for all these enterprise companies, um, is supply chain management on the blockchain. Because like, imagine you know, you've got a company that's producing goods in China that's then distributing those goods, you know, to the port of Los Angeles and Long Beach or in Oakland or here in the Bay Area or, you know, up in Seattle. You know, then they've got to track it to Target or Walmart or wherever their point of sales are. Um, and you've got, you know, so you've got a company in China running one system. You've got the shipping company using a different system. You've got then, you know, whatever uh, shipping, you know, company trucking company that you have in the US. Um, and you've got all these different systems and none of them talk to each other. A lot of that data gets lost. Uh, and it's a nightmare. Um, one of the companies that's like most famous for having amazing supply chain solutions uh, is actually Apple. Um, and Apple, it was actually under Tim Cook's leadership, uh, even previous to him being CEO, uh, this is really what got him the job as CEO, is he revamped Apple's entire supply chain. So back in the day, Apple used to have to buy, you know, they would build 50,000 computers, put them in a warehouse in, you know, Texas, and then have to, sh you know, sell those 50,000 computers. Obviously, you know, I'm, I just pulled that number out of the air, but, um, you know, there, they had to have serious warehousing. Uh, you know, they took multiple days to move product across the country. They had major, major supply chain issues. So, and then they were, you know, if a product didn't sell, 
So maybe Apple came out with a model of computer that nobody bought and everyone bought the other model, which totally happens. Um, you know, then, you know, for some reason, everyone bought the SE extended edition, you know, model, but they didn't buy the base model. So now they're sitting on a bunch of base models that they can't sell. Um, so what uh, Tim Cook did is he created a new supply chain management system that allowed Apple to deliver products direct from the warehouse in China to consumers using FedEx, using UPS, using shipping companies here in the United States uh, to actually get those products to your door. So like when a new iPhone comes out and you order the new iPhone on the day one and you know, you're in that first batch of orders, you are literally getting your phone directly from China. Um, it does not go and sit in a warehouse. It doesn't, they don't do that anymore. Even the Apple stores uh, barely carry any product. So they, uh, you know, they have a base number that they, uh, you know, know that this store gets X amount of foot traffic. Um, and they, you know, they'll keep a, you know, a certain number of certain models. Um, and that's it. So those types, so that's a really good example of like a really secure centralized supply chain solution. And, you know, the benefits from that were, you know, now Apple doesn't have to pay for warehousing. They don't have, you know, computers that if they don't sell them that are just sitting there because they literally don't build your computer now unless they know they can sell it. Um, so these are the types of solutions and technologies that a decentralized supply chain management solution could piece together for smaller businesses as well as enterprise companies. So now startups can build a supply chain similar to what Apple built. To, for Apple to build this supply chain, they had to build a centralized system that probably cost them billions of dollars and a decade to figure out. Um, so now imagine if that same, these same principles and the same concepts of what we just talked about in the centralized system, if you could decentralize that, put that into a decentralized, uh, you know, decentralized system where all these different things are talking to each other. Now, you know, someone who wants to create a, a you know, a new hardware startup to sell, you know, mobile devices or, you know, tablets or whatever, they could build a point of sale system and a, a supply chain management system similar to Apple's uh, by leveraging off the shelf decentralized tech. Um, so that that's never really existed before. You've had to go pay premiums. You've had to go, uh, you know, work with major enterprise companies. You've used to have, you ha currently to participate in the current centralized system, you have to pay to play. Uh, and it's not cheap. So those kind of relationships uh, and the kinds of things that, you know, you needed to have to be able to make these, these things a reality, those things in a decentralized system then become obtainable by smaller startups. They become obtainable by smaller to medium-sized companies and allows these companies to compete. Um, so that'll, that'll be a game changer. That'll allow for innovation uh, to happen. That'll allow for consumers to get products faster. Um, it will also allow for companies to, uh, to have less waste. Um, so th this also will improve efficiency. So it's gonna be more environmentally sound. Um, this is going, these solutions are going to, you know, reduce having warehouses. Um, it's going to reduce the energy footprint of what it takes to, you know, actually deliver real world goods. Um, so there's a lot of different benefits that will come from this. Um, so supply chain management is going to be a major, major multi-billion dollar blockchain industry. That's where IBM is focusing their energy and time right now. They've landed some major projects already, uh, like that company I mentioned, uh, you know, Lannister Development, the one that's publicly traded, they're doing the same thing. Like they're working with, you know, medium to uh, enterprise companies on helping them create new supply chain management systems on the blockchain. And a lot of those systems, they're th using things like Hyperledger, um, they're using, you know, other uh, blockchain systems and they're using permission blockchain systems. So, you know, there's, you know, obviously, like a lot of the projects that we've seen so far publicly that talk about like, you know, oh, yeah, we're creating this, you know, free decentralized system where, you know, every that's fully transparent and whatnot. Uh, well, transparency is awesome and great. But at the same time, you know, permissioning and having permissions within a system for a business is a good thing. 
Um, it allows the people that are doing a certain task to be able to focus on what their task is um, rather than you know, having getting overwhelmed by having too much data. Um, so for example, you know, if you're a shipping company that's a trucking company, you only need to know uh, how do I get this package from you know the port to the address it needs to be delivered. You don't necessarily need to know anything else. Um, so having the permission to be able to do that is really important. And then basically you have what would be like equivalent to a super admin or a moderator who would be at the top who then has access to all the data. So they would be able to see, you know, what the shipping company did, what the company in China did, what the, you know, what the delivery company in the United States did. So they have full access and transparency to the data of all the different components that that's, you know, whatever they were shipping, uh, you know, went through. But, uh, and then that record could be, you know, digitally even attached to the, that physical item. Um, so that's going to be, that's going to be a, you know, like I said, that's going to be a huge market. Um, and that's going to be one of the major infrastructure plays is these permission uh, blockchains so that, you know, certain people have access to the data as needed. And then certain people at a certain level will have full transparency and full access to all of the data. So I know some blockchain purists out there like might disagree with this and say, oh, you know, screw permission blockchains. You may as well just use a centralized database. But at the same time, there is a total benefit to using a decentralized database and using a decentralized network because these people are using different software systems for different purposes. So having an underlying connection between them is a good thing. Yes, it is important to, to prevent corruption as well. Um, so one of the other things that I think we're gonna see take off uh, soon is digital assets. Um, so my my best example of this is not CryptoKitties, but actually the game Fortnite. Um, Fortnite is printing money, selling digital goods. Um, they sell skins. They sell you know items. Uh, these are digital items within a game. So for example, you can go on eBay right now and buy someone's Fortnite account, um, and literally pay thousands of dollars for. Uh, for uh, you know, for a Fortnite account because it has a specific skin in it. So, to me, that doesn't make any sense. Um, you know, there should be a marketplace. There should be a system um, that you can trade those digital assets. Why can't I sell the skin that I bought a year ago to my brother for five dollars? Um, you know, why can't uh, if I've got a super rare skin or super rare item? You know, why can't I sell that and profit off it on a, in a marketplace? Um, and then the other thing is there could be revenue sharing between the game developer as well. So this is also an opportunity for the game developer. Uh, please ask your question. Go ahead and I'll answer it when I can. Um, yes, exactly. Why is an indie game developer, can you not use that skin in your game? Um, for example, another thing is, uh, you know, uh, games where you earn items. So, for example, let's say, you know, you're playing the latest Call of Duty. You got, you know, you beat a certain level or whatever. You get a certain rare gun. Um, and then the new version of Call of Duty comes out a year later. And now you start over from scratch. Um, so you've lost the ability. You've lost your item. You know, you, you spent an entire year getting this super rare item in the game. And then the new game comes out, and now all of a sudden, all that, all that success you had in the previous game does not carry over. So if you were to write those digital assets to a blockchain, if you were a lot, would allow the consumer to actually put that into a wallet or a PlayStation account or Xbox account or something like that and store those digital items, now when the new version of Call of Duty comes out, I can take all my weapons, all my rare items from the last version of Call of Duty and move them into the new version of Call of Duty. And I didn't, I'm able to take all of those items with me. Um, you know, CryptoKitties was an interesting example of, you know, how you could build a crypto game, but like they kind of half assed it. Um, they didn't really build game mechanics into the game, and that's why it's kind of failing. Um, so, you know, now CryptoKitties is not doing the kind of numbers it used to be doing. Uh, you know, it's really, it's really just digital beanie babies. Um, there's no game behind it. 
um, you know, at least like Magic the Gathering and like Pogs and like, you know, Pokemon and all these other, you know, previous similar games or entities, like they had a game. Um, there's no game to CryptoKitties. So what I think we're going to see is people are going to start gamifying uh, digital assets and gifts, digital gifts are going to be a huge thing in different platforms. Imagine being able to go on Instagram or Twitter or even here on Discord and be able to, you know, buy someone a digital gift, uh, you know, and send it to them immediately. It's written to the blockchain. Uh, you know, that gift is unique to them. It's rare. Um, you know, you can start to do stuff like that. You could even, you could even do like, uh, you know, there's a company, uh, Rare Bits. They've got another project called Fan Bits. Um, they've got. Uh, you know they've got a lot of uh, they've got a lot of uh, you know they've built a project as well where you can do like collectibles uh, for you know people who are creators that create art or uh, that do photography or other forms of digital goods. So I think we're going to start to see more and more of that, um, especially as we kind of transition to this economy where you know more mo people are making money from their social media followings. Um, so you know there's going to be collectibles, digital goods. Um, and I think there's going to, that's, that's going to be another multi-billion dollar industry. Uh, and once the video game industry embraces it, uh, there's going to be, it's going to completely change gaming forever. Um, especially once you start to get into like VR, uh, and augmented reality, because now, uh, you know, if you create an item in augmented reality or in a virtual world, you know, to be able to take those items with you between virtual worlds and different games, um, that's going to be huge. Uh, so now, you know, if you create something in one virtual world, you can now take it to another virtual world. Um, and that, when that starts to happen, we're going to see digital assets take off. Um, when this is going to happen, I don't know, could be a couple of years, could be, you know, it, it's going to take some time, um, but it's definitely going to happen. Um, so what else we had, uh, I've not, uh, yeah, Decentraland, um, you know, there's high fidelity that's out there too. Um, uh, they are not really fully, I don't think high fidelity is decentralized, but, uh, Decentraland is, uh, Decentraland kind of reminds me of like Second Life. Second Life, uh, was a virtual world that was launched back in the 2000, early 2000s. Um, they actually had land and they had their own currency called the Linden dollar. Um, so, you know, it was an interesting, it was kind of interesting to see what they did because they basically had a digital currency. They had the ability to buy digital land. Um, and it was fairly successful back in the day. Um, yeah, it was over a hundred K for digital items and digital land. So, I mean, people made millions of dollars selling digital land and literally we're becoming digital real estate brokers on second life. Uh, there was a moment in time when that happened. Um, but, uh, you know, there, there was definitely, uh, you know, that, yeah, like I said, that there was a moment in time that happened. So I imagine as new virtual worlds get created, uh, as VR becomes more of a thing in the future, um, then we'll start to see more of that and we'll likely see the blockchain as the underlying infrastructure for how those digital assets are managed um, because it allows users to put those digital assets into a wallet and take them from virtual world to virtual world. Um, so I, I definitely fully anticipate uh, that we're going to see that uh, over the next you know few years here. Um, and I have not heard of uh, Gods Unchained. Is that a game I'm guessing? it up real quick yeah cool yeah it looks like it's uh, a crypto game collect and battle gods and unchanged competitive sports so yeah definitely definitely gonna see more of that um i was talking to a, a founder who uh he has an esports company and like i mean esports right now while we're doing this pod you know this this live broadcast um i mean there are literally more people playing video games and watching other people playing video games than people who watch the Super Bowl. Um, so, 
you know, the amount of people who watch other people playing video games is a multi-billion dollar industry. Um, and it's huge. Um, there are people who gamble on watching people play video games. Uh, you know, Twitch has obviously taken off and become a huge phenomenon, bought, got bought out by Amazon. Um, you know, that, and I don't expect that trend to decrease anytime soon. I expect it actually to increase. And I expect uh, as we move in and transition into augmented reality games, virtual reality games over the next, you know, five to 10 years, uh, that, you know, kind of these e-celebrities and, uh, uh, you know, virtual players and whatnot, are, it's just going to become bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, and, you know, being able to attach the blockchain to that, do different blockchain project, uh, you know, collectibles and rare items and uh, take items between virtual worlds, that that's going to be a huge industry. Um, so, you know, that's where I kind of see the blockchain going right now is, you know, on one side, it's going to go into permission blockchains on the enterprise, and it's going to help businesses become more efficient, and it's going to help smaller businesses operate and compete at the same level as larger uh, businesses. And then we're going to see video games and virtual worlds um, and uh, mobile games and AR games and all of that kind of stuff uh, start to take off. And that is going to be possibly even just as large an industry, if not larger, uh, than supply chain management and real world, world goods. Um, and the companies that I think are going to be the most successful um, are the ones who are building infrastructure right now, like Holochain, like Ethereum, uh, like, uh, you know, Prometheur. Uh, and it's going to become, you know, dev agencies and companies that, you know, build talented, well-resourced blockchain companies that can actually make projects happen. Um, those things are critical. Um, there's a project uh, that I that I'm, I'm not like officially an advisor on yet, but I'm I'm in position to possibly become an advisor. Uh, you know, they're building a blockchain solution uh, for hiring blockchain developers. So literally using the blockchain to build a you know upwork like hiring system fully managed through the blockchain to be able to uh, you know to be able to create a um, it's not it's uh, actually or I believe the company is called aura uh, aura coin maybe let me look that up uh, I think it's aura coin yeah. It's a decentralized developer recruitment network. So they're, um, so they're. Uh, I think they're about to do a, a crowd fund soon. Um, they're doing a traditional crowd fund, uh, and then I believe eventually they will do some kind of ICO in the future um, once they launch uh, their utility token. So, you know, that's. You know that's where we are is we're still even at the infrastructure point of you know how do i hire a blockchain developer um that is a major pro problem for a lot of uh blockchain projects uh and i've noticed a trend where there are blockchain projects that are out there and there are icos that do not have anybody in the company that has any experience coding on the blockchain or has any experience in the blockchain space um so you know, those companies are going to have higher developers and agencies if their ICOs are successful. Um, and they're going to need systems to do that. So, you know, companies like Oracoin, it looks like, you know, ETH Lance is doing something similar. Um, you know, those, those are infrastructure plays. Then those are, you know, human infrastructure plays on how to make this happen and make this a reality. Um, because, at the end of the day, it's people who are going to be programming these smart contracts. It's people who are going to be building these blockchains, building these networks, building these dis decentralized applications. Uh, and, you know, there needs to be uh, economic systems and economic incentives uh, for people to dedicate their time and energy to learning how to develop for different blockchain platforms and projects. And as projects get more advanced, um, we're going to see more APIs more developer-friendly tools, uh, more development platforms, more development tools, more frameworks. Um, and these are all good things that will help 
uh, bring more and more developers uh, to the blockchain, and it'll allow for people to kind of shortcut a path to developing decentralized application. Um, so when that happens, when a UI UX designer um, who you know doesn't have much coding experience can sit down with a backend developer who does have some coding experience, who can just pull from APIs, leverage existing frameworks, uh, then you know they can start to put puzzle pieces together rather than have to sit down and write entire projects from scratch. Uh, they'll be able to pull from a library of smart contracts that are vetted, tested, that you know are in production with other companies. They'll be able to have open source libraries of different code for different, uh, you know, different executing different transactions. Um, these sort of things will, you know, the the cream will rise to the top. Um, so that'll, you know, that's that's going to happen over time, uh, and that's going to enable the development of decentralized applications in the future, uh, and that's going to be huge. So I've got to wrap up soon. So are there any final questions before I go? I know uh, uh, Cardi had a question, but I don't think it's been asked yet. So I'll wait a couple minutes before I've uh, I've got to I've got to jump here. But uh, yeah, if anyone's got any other questions, you know, thanks again uh, for having me on. This was awesome. Uh, you know, it's. I'm usually the guy asking the questions and you know on my podcast uh so i don't actually always get to talk about this stuff so um it's been cool to actually get to do that uh and talk about what i've learned and what i've seen um because you know this is a this is definitely you know a fascinating moment in history in the tech space um and crypto and blockchain are you know they're gonna change they're already changing the world and they already have uh and it's it's just going to increase. So no matter what the value of Bitcoin itself is, uh, you know, blockchain, you know, for the all the other use cases that I've just talked about, uh, you know, is going to have a global impact and to help make the world a more efficient and fair and balanced place. Uh, and it's also going to create whole new economies uh, for digital assets and digital goods. And it's going to allow the digital generation to be able to make money uh, and create value for people in a new way. And I think that's critical and important for artists, creators, uh, inventors, um, entertainers, you name it. Um, you know, it's there, it's going to be a, uh, it's going to be a huge opportunity. So I, uh, I got to get going here, guys. So if you got any final questions, this is the time to ask. Uh, I'll jump in about five minutes. And Alexander, we're we're just wrapping up here. Um, I think we've got a recording of this. So uh, yeah, you can go ahead and end the recording actually now. Um,